Pull up a chair, boys and girls. It's time to talk. And when I was playing out here, I was a Georgetown Hoya fan, man. So I did not grow up as a Terp fan until I saw Lynn Bias. About one of the greatest to ever dominate the hard game. Yeah. Long pass up court. Bias Lynn Bias. Let me set the scene for you. 1981, I'm a senior at Montgomery Blair High School. Now high schoolers, we're all about our own world. But we'd all heard about the local kid. Of course I knew who he was. He went to Northwest, I mean, he was a local guy. I, everyone knew who he was. His interest in basketball did not come to light until he reached middle school. And then you had seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. And by the time he reached the eighth grade, he had an interest in that sport. The skinny, lanky, raw kid, most knew him as Len. Those who really knew him. Len was special. Len Bias was a former classmate of mine at the University of Maryland. Maryland has this dynamic high-flying forward named Len Bias. Maybe one of the best players ever to play at the University of Maryland. I said, that's the guy. You know, he was unbelievable. Unfortunately for me, uh, I had a coach against him for four years in the ACC. Well, I mean, he's a heck of a player. Len Bias was not a, a great player. He was a transcendent player. He's one of the best players I've ever seen. Uh, I was a student here uh, when Leonard was uh, a god on campus. And um, growing up a Terp fan, he's, he was the guy then and remains my all-time favorite Terp. He was the best damn player. He was the best. The 1980s weren't the era of LeBron James and one and duns and high school athletes that were so highly recruited and so well known that there was buzz about them. Nobody knew much about Lynn Bias. Sports writers knew, coaches knew. I made one um, recruiting visit to Lenny's high school. And um, it was a workout, the coach was there, and there were a lot of other coaches there, including Lefty Drizel. And afterwards, the coach told me, he said, uh, Bobby, appreciate you coming. Um, I know you got a, a really good program. Bobby Kremitz cannot be too unhappy with what he's seen so far, Mike. But it looks like uh, Lenny is going to stay local. Well, I have to thank him for that. <laughs> you knew that he was coming, which was cool, but what he turned out to be was so much more than what this preceding hype was, if you will. When Lynn Bias was a freshman, he was sort of an afterthought. Maryland already had a pretty good team. Adrian Branch, another local product from DeMatha, was the star of that team. Guard number 24, 6'8", junior from Largo, Maryland, Adrian Branch. And Lefty Drizel was even the bigger star of the team. We'd probably be four number one teams in the country, anybody in the world. Man, that's, that's when we rise to the case, man, when we play number one. Lefty thought that if he got Lynn Bias, um, that he was going to be all right for two or three more years at least, and he was correct, but the campus was not buzzing. Well, like I told you, he wasn't that highly recruited. So, it, in fact, I didn't start him the first 10 or 12 games of his freshman year. And then I think we got beat by Penn State or something, and I started starting him. The thing that was so cool, if you go back and, and you, if you remember it, and I do, is he went from being this guy that maybe was going to be something. And then you fast forward to his sophomore year, and he's becoming something more than that. The fact that he got markedly better each year, and there were these landmark things, you know, winning an ACC tournament. And Maryland has won the 1984 ACC championship with a 74-62 win over Duke. Let's just watch the dirt celebrate. He just had a way of punctuating things.
for Lynn Byers. You want credentials? ACC Tournament Champion. Back-to-back -back ACC Player of the Year honors. Consensus All-American. How good was he? Well, Coach K, you know that dude from Duke? He's on record as saying there have been two opposing players who really stood out. Michael Jordan, Lem Bias. The scouting report on Len was double team, triple team, and hope that he missed. He could shoot over you, uh, he could jump over you. You gotta remember, I'm the same 17-year-old kid who's idolizing the guy less than, you know, a year before that, and now here I am playing my first pickup game with him. And so I'm, I'm kind of in awe. I remember the one particular play, uh, matter of fact, it was the first game that we won when we got out. And again, it was nip and tuck back and forth. There's elbows. Allery from long range, a little strong. Tip. It's Danny Ferry with two cracks at it. Won't go. No whistle. A lot of contact. And Ferry just shoved Tony Massenberg out of the way. And I'm feeling good about it because I got my guy, Lynn Bias, on my team. So uh, it's game point. And somebody on our team takes a jump shot. And I remember Lynn Bias flying in. I'm, I'm underneath and I'm getting ready to go for the ball. And before I can jump, I see Lynn flying in over top of everybody, gets the rebound, hits the floor right in front of me, and without bending his knees in a split second, went right back up and reverse dunked it on three guys, three guys who contested it. And when he dunked it, reverse dunked it, I just literally stood there. And I was nowhere. I looked up. I was under the basket. I just jumped up and just dunked it up. I think only because I've seen it so often over the years and everybody has talked about it. It's the play against North Carolina. It's the steal and then the reverse jam. That was just an unbelievable play. I hadn't seen nothing like that before. Bias from outside and he got it. Lynn Bias with 29. Oh my! And he made the steal and a jam! What a play by Bias! He makes what would be a three now against Carolina, goes and steals the inbound pass, and, you know, reverse dunks on poor Warren Martin's head. Like, that's the thing that comes to your mind. But the one I'll remember forever, when he was a senior, he went to U-Haul at Charlottesville, and uh, Olden Polonies blocked his shot, and Bias, like, fell down, like, slid on his butt. And Polonese went over and barked in his face and waved his finger at him. Well, he shouldn't have done that. Because senior day was against Virginia. So the olden Polonese, the 6'11 junior against the 6'8 senior Len Bias. Maryland with a big lead in this series. And in the last game, Virginia won convincingly. The tip control by Jeff Baxter. And the crowd will be in it every time Len Bias touches the ball. Bias has planted that seed and watered it, let it grow, and there's a sequence. Everyone else is playing defense. Bias is standing like in Polonese's face, waving his finger in his ear, screaming at him because he just got this block. The sequence continues. Another shot gets blocked, and it ends up with Jeff Baxter throwing an alley-oop to Speedy Jones. Terry Holland, timeout. And the entire timeout, one half of cold chance Len and the other half of cold chance bias. And I, I can hear it in my head right now. And that's that's the play. Everyone, Carolina play, sure. Singular play. Bias remembering how pissed off he is at Polonese, wanting to get even, getting even, and then it leading to this alley oop dunk and timeout and Len bias, Len bias, Len bias. That's the play. The two biggest players in the area were Patrick Ewing at Georgetown and then Len Bias at Maryland. And Len Bias, really, his senior year had a breakout year. The performance that he had at Duke 
I mean, my senior year, he had 41 on us. Lenny Bias, he drops one through and on top of it draws a foul. But it wasn't an awful lot Jay Billis could do on that play. One thing that you can't do is play behind the Lenny Bias. Now it goes to the baseline. Bias, and he hit it fading away and on an angle. Now Bias has uh, displayed simply a virtuoso performance for the Maryland Terrapins. We still won the game but he was absolutely unstoppable. Lynn Bias was one of the most graceful athletes I ever saw play basketball to this day. When he comes sky and just shoot that shot from outside. He just went up, straight up, and he just shot it at the top of the jump. And I know that sounds like a simple thing, Bias baseline, got it. but it isn't. And even if it's simple, it's magnificent. Lynn Bias had a magnificent jump shot. Yeah, when he did a jump shot and Michael Jordan was trying to block it and Michael Jordan got about to his elbow. He pulled that shirt out and just like, the man's ready to go. Here he goes. Just turn it up a notch. Bias squares off. As I just mentioned, it is going to be a physical game. I'm doing a story in Orlando with Tracy McGrady. And as I'm walking out, I'm 6'6", six, six, and McGrady's kind of eyeballing me. He's like, he's like you, uh, you play ball? I was like, yeah. I was a good high school player, like intramural all-star type. I said, I went to Maryland. That was a little too good for me. I said, I was there when, when Leonard Bias was there. So you know about Bias? He's like, I am. And I was like, I didn't like, see him see him. As I'm saying this, Horace Grant walks out of a side door. And McGrady says to Horace Green, he's like, oh, what do you know about Len Bye? The story loses its juice if I don't quote him directly. But Horace Grant looks at McGrady and goes, whew, that was the baddest I ever saw. And McGrady goes, so you played with Jordan? And Horace Grant said, like I said, that was the baddest I ever saw. And I look at McGrady and go, into his own trap. They're going to try to trap Maryland on him. Lenny Bias. He's going to pull the rim down here in a minute. But when he starts for the bucket, uh, the wise players clear out. The Boston Celtics select Len Bias of the University of Maryland. There he is, Len Bias. Len was sitting by his mother. She is here with him. You were with him that night up in New York in Madison Square Garden? No, I wasn't. Oh, you didn't go up there? No, he was with his dad. His dad went with him. I was home with the children. Len Bias had a great career at Maryland. Many people think he may be the best athlete in the draft. I'll tell you, this is a great kid. As a matter of fact, you know, Larry Bird said that if we draft Bias, he's going to come up to the rookie camp. <laughs> That's right. He is very, very high on bias, as Casey was, and Jimmy, and, and the owners, you know, Alan Kahn and Don Gaston. They're all high on him, and he's the guy we wanted, and we got him. The temperature in the room always changes at this point in the story. Yeah, I'm in the NBA now. I've got drafted, so now my dream has come true. Now I have to do is go out and play and set some more goals. At the time, I was an intern at Channel 9 helping the news department cover Lenny's end when it felt like we had just seen his beginning. It was awful. It was tragic. Len Bias, star forward from the University of Maryland basketball team, is now dead. What it also was, was a lesson. In a community sense, this was someone whose promise seemed guaranteed. And you wanted to watch it, you wanted to follow it, you wanted to be consumed by it. And yes, we remember exactly where we were and what we were doing when we found out he was, he was not with us any longer. The next morning when I had gotten to work and I had gotten there real early, one of the editors had said to me, did you hear about your guy, Len Bias? And I said, no, well, what happened to him? He said, well, you, you better look. And when I saw what happened, I was in absolute 
shocked. We got a call in the newsroom and some guy says to me, hey Johnny, I work at Leland Memorial Hospital. They just brought Lynn Bias in. They think he had a heart attack. A local success story took a tragic turn this morning. Len Bias, the Maryland University basketball star on his way to becoming a world champion Boston Celtic, died of an apparent heart attack today at Leland Memorial Hospital in Prince George's County. Actually, my mom woke me up and told me. I was sleeping a little bit late, and I made a couple of phone calls and, and found out it was true. And, uh, and I was, I think all of us were. When I was in school here at Maryland, my, my girlfriend throughout my whole time here uh, lived in Pennsylvania. And um, I had been up in Pennsylvania to see her. And I was managing a pool at the time. A very important summer work. And I came back from visiting my girlfriend, stopped at a 7-Eleven in only Maryland on my way to the pool. And I see my best friend's younger brother. And my best friend's name Corey Salveson, his brother's name Lee. I see Lee, and Lee's got, Lee sees me and says, man, you hear about bias. And I said, yeah, man, you're going to the Celtics? That's unbelievable. And I never forget the look on his face. He, and he just looks at me and he says, bias is dead, man. I was like, what are you talking about? Like, you're like, wait, I, I'm standing in line with a big gulp, you know, in 7-Eleven. And I'm like, I, I'm, you, you, you're, the shock of what I heard and it not making any sense, and but at the same time, there's no reason he'd say this to me if it's not true. And you're, you start, I start like pacing. There's again, there's no phone. There's no, I didn't know. So I go out to a payphone, because that's what, right? I plop, I put a quarter in a payphone. I try to call Keith Gatlin, and I can't get him because obviously he's not sitting by his phone. And I immediately get in my car and I turn on WTOP radio, and I and I sat there on a on a summer day listening to them say that what I had just heard was true, and it was it just um, obviously for so many reasons it's sad. It's not what basketball lost; it's what we all lost for just such a great person and a great leader and a great human being. When he went to New York, I never saw him again until he was on uh, the table at Leland Hospital dead. It's a bitter cup, and I tell anyone, if you can think what it feels like to lose a child, it's a hundred times worse than you think. Still stands out on my mind today is walking down the hallway at the old coal fuel house and seeing Dick Dahl, the athletic director. I've been here 10 years and I've never seen a day as dark and sad as this one. Uh, we love Lenny Bias for what he did for Maryland, but we loved him more because he was a good person and our friend. Uh, everybody that ever watched him play admired him and everybody that ever met him loved him. And seeing the president of the university walking toward me with absolutely no expression on their faces, they too felt like everybody else did. We're, we're in a bad dream. This, this just can't be happening. It's one of the saddest, um, most shocking, um, you know, depressing times. As a reporter, you always want to cover big stories, but you don't want to cover big stories like that. Mr. Bias died of cocaine intoxication, which interrupted the normal electrical activity of his brain, which controlled his heartbeat. It's not hyperbole to say that it changed the direction of everything. It was a weird time in the 80s because not long after that, uh, Don Rogers, the football player, died of the same thing. And, uh, and that led to action by Congress. The Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986, uh, which was a bipartisan piece of legislation. As a matter of fact, our current president voted for it. It was something that was even referred to as Len Bias's law. Uh, by some, and it established mandatory minimum sentencing, which is really what caused, uh, particularly in the federal system, mass incarceration. The American people want their government to get tough and to go on the offensive, and that's exactly what we intend. It's about the lessons learned in the mid to late 1980s with drugs in America. This was not a basketball problem, per se. This was not a sports problem. 
This was a societal problem. This was a cultural problem. It was a national problem. See this cute little vial here? It's crack, rock cocaine, the most addictive form. You think it's the glamour drug of the 80s? Well, that's the point of this fronted little reminder. It can kill you. And if you've got to die for something, this sure as hell ain't it. I, mean, I don't even know how you quantify it. And even now, I think about his family and what they went through, and then what they went through afterwards. He was the best brother that I think ever in the whole world, the best brother. Anything that he wanted done, I mean, anything that you needed, he jumped right on it. Always on top of his job. I always think about his mom and everything that she went through because she ended up losing another son. Um, he was a gunshot victim. So here you have two sons, one lost to drugs, the other one shot to death, and just her strength and what she's done with her life in the wake of these two tragedies. You want to talk perseverance and endurance? I'll never forget when Dr. Bias stopped us all in our tracks. She was talking about her son, Lenny, and then she paused and looked up at the ceiling. I thought I'd said something wrong. Then she said the following. You know, Chick, I can't express to you the feeling of burying one son while standing on the other son's grave. They should have had longer lives, but because of the hardships of life, and the crisis and the suddenlies that come in life, uh, we took lemons and made lemonade with the help of God. It was sour, it was stinky, it was nasty. We didn't like any of it, but God gave us the strength to endure. I really don't know if I'm up to this, but uh, you know, I guess Leonard would want me to say something. You know, he's a, I've known Leonard since he was in about the sixth grade. He's like a son to me, so I think you can appreciate the difficulty of the way I feel right now. He was just a super individual. It, it, it went beyond the basketball program, and it, quit, and it went quickly beyond the basketball program. There was turmoil in terms of academics. You know, he didn't uh, finish a lot of classes his senior year because he was trying out for all these teams drug policies, it, there was really very little drug testing, not only at Maryland, but any, across the country. The, the dominoes began to fall, and first it was, I believe it was Dick Dull who resigned uh, in, during the summer, the athletic director, who was very popular, had done a great job sort of marketing the Terps, and, and, and he became the first scapegoat of, of, the bi of Bias's death, and then, and then Lefty. You know, someone had to pay, I guess, uh, and he, he did with his job, and, and then things, the direction of that program and everything else changed. Sometimes I get questions about the book that Walt and I wrote, Lessons from Lenny, and, and people say, well, why did you write that book? And there were two goals that Walt and I had in mind. One was to, first of all, help people understand that there were a lot of positives that came from Lynn Bias's life and his death. And the one thing that we thought was lost uh, in his death was his legacy. I remember Lenny's smile That big ass smile when he was out there, and that deep voice. When I first did interviews with him, when he came out of Northwestern High School, he was not a good interview. Very, very quiet, very tough to get anything out of him. And then as he got more comfortable his sophomore and junior year, uh, he became one of the best interviews on the team. But it was not about him, he always made a point I would bring up something, hey, you had 35 against Carolina in the Dean Dome. That's the first loss they ever had in North Carolina. He wanted to talk about a pass from Keith Gatton. Got it and laid it in, and North Carolina has been upset by Maryland. He didn't want to talk about himself. Dean Smith shaking lefty's hand. 
So Maryland upsets North Carolina in overtime. The first loss here in the Student Activity Center named after Dean Smith. The final 77-72. We'll be back in a minute on the Maryland Basketball Network. And I remember how he was all team, not about him. We wanted to play confident, we practice hard. We got the open shots that we wanted when we were in practice, so we just drilled on it. it seemed like it came like clockwork today. Gatlin told me a great story. They're playing at NC State, and they're wearing like yellow jerseys, I want to say it was. But he's sweating so much during this game, and it's in Reynolds Coliseum, old NC State building. And the, the paint that's in the jersey and his sweat, it's like there's the color of the jersey is coming down his gigantic biceps. And Lefty looks at Leonard and says, look at Leonard. Leonard is a warrior. Give the ball to Leonard. I don't know if I said that or not. I, I might have, because I used to brag on him all the time, because any time we had a, ran suicides or something, or sprints, he came in first. And um, he was in, in great shape and, you know, a, a wonderful young man. With that work ethic and that God-given ability, I learned that it's not just enough to be uh, a good basketball player. If you want to be great, you have to put in the work that great players do. And I watched Lynn Bias do that for that one year that I had to play with him. And I passed that on to Walt Williams, who in turn passed it on to Johnny Rose, who in turn passes it on to Keith Booth, to a Joe Smith, to a, a Juan Dixon, to a Chris Wilcox, to a Lonnie Baxter. When we used to come out here and play on these blacktops, before the game would start, a number of us would yell out who we were going to pretend to be that day. And most often times, I would, I would get a chance to be Lynn Byers. That, that meant something to me. And so I, I wanted the kids in this neighborhood, in my community, I wanted them to come out here and, and play the game and pretend like they were me, you know, like I did Lynn Byers. And so I felt like the only way that I could be Lynn Byers, man, was to follow in his footsteps and, and come to the University of Maryland. Try the alley-oop to Bias, and he really got up to hit it, and West, the freshman, fouled him, so a chance for the three-point play. Well, Bias does so many things well. You saw that time how high he got up. Watch the pass, very high above the rim. There's not enough accolades. Mark Price, I talked to Mark Price. Price to Sally, got it back at the baseline. He moves so well without the ball. And he says, Coach Lenny Bias, was one of the greatest players to ever played the game. I'll tell you what, I like him. He is a tremendous player on the offensive end, always around the basket. They were handing out on campus life-size posters of Len Bias. Everyone had one in their room. I mean, that's how big of a player he was. We had a life-size poster of a classmate. In 1986, when Len finished his career at Maryland, that spring he came down and he gave us his jersey. And over the next few years, people would come in and just stand in front of it and almost like have reverence for Lynn Bias. Parents would bring their children in and point to the jersey. So it was a significant part of our Maryland history. And then in the early 90s, one morning I came to work and the opening manager said, you're not gonna be very happy. And I said, why? He said, Lynn Bias's jersey was stolen last night. I said, no way. It was bolted to the wall. He said, yeah, but they popped the glass, got the jersey, and got it out of here. That stayed that way for about two years. And we really kind of just thought it was gone. And then one day, uh, some Maryland lacrosse players came in and said that they had been at a party in Annapolis over the weekend. And there were some guys at the party talking about having in their possession a piece of great Maryland history. We said, whoa, 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 whoa. Find out everything you can and let us know and we'll see what happens. But that was in the spring. In December of that year, I was opening mail and a brown envelope came in. The mail, and I just I took it, opened it, and then it was a Lynn Bias jersey. I thought, my gosh, it came home. It's back. No note, no return address, just Lynn's jersey. So we proudly hung it again, this time bolted to the wall, but behind plexiglass, so that it really can't be taken. And for the most part, you would think that's the end of the story. But about a year or so later, a young lady that I knew pretty well came in and was telling me that she knew the guys that took the jersey. And said they took it and they each took turns hanging it in their house or on their walls. But the one that had it had tremendous bad luck. 
So finally they decided it was the curse of the bias jersey, so they sent it back and now we happily have it. It's been a blessing for us. It was every game he did something that we had never seen before. So I don't believe what I just saw. And he'd do it game after game. Amazed us. Yeah, when you saw Len Bias and you tried to square that somebody once said and wrote, all men are created equal. All men are created equal. When you saw Len Bias, you know, not all men are created equal. He was created better. Yeah, but he was, he was something else. You just look like a kid in a, in a superhero's body. I mean, I don't know, it's not one thing, it's, it's everything. It's, it's what he looked like, it's how he played. It's how he played made you as a Maryland fan feel. It's how crushing it was um, that it ended, you know? Like, what will I remember about Leonard Bias? I'll remember everything, and I'll remember all of it as long as I live. So when people ask who was Len Bias, that's easy. Local kid turned legend who left us with what could have been. But as his mother told us time and time again, he did more in his passing than, well, you know. Frosty, much love, we miss you. And Terp Nation, damn proud in your induction into the Collegiate Basketball Hall of Fame.